Praise the Lord, church. Aren't you thankful for a God that is merciful, a God that is graceful, a God that is detail-oriented? I began to think about it looking at Google Earth and just looking at how, how precise how God is. I began to have it all zoomed out, and I couldn't tell the difference from Texas to Louisiana. But as I began to zoom in, it only got so far. But God zooms in so much on us that in Luke 12 and 6, it says he was talking about the worth of the sparrows and that they are sold for two farthings. But what's not important, but what it's important is what God was talking about, but your, even your very hairs are numbered on your head. But, man, but then he began to say, if you talk about me down here, I will talk about you up there. He says, I'll talk about you to the angels of heaven. All of heaven will know who you are. But what's most important is we just get together and give God praise. Give God worship today. We thank you, Jesus. baseline the scripture says he knows even the number of your hairs on your head so if he don't know the problems in your life I don't know what to tell you right now but God wants to help you today so we want to bring up miracle opportunities if you have needs today please come forth that way we can pray with you let's keep in mind of Ayla Mae Sanders and the other needs that are available on the board let's just go in prayer lord we thank you for today god lord we thank you for all that you have done god we ask you to minister to the needs tonight god we ask you to heal the ones from the heads of their feet to the soles of their feet today god lord we thank you we'll give you praise and we'll give you honor in jesus name
Him, magnify Him, and exalt Him, Lord. You're a miracle-working, powerful God that's able to do exceedingly abundantly, Lord, and we worship You. We magnify Your great and holy name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Amen. There are a host of announcements, and hopefully you picked up a bulletin to keep yourself up to date on all the things that are going on starting tomorrow. Uh, this Wednesday, it's youth choir practice at 7 p.m. I want to encourage all of our young people to be here. Amen. And then there is also uh, this Saturday at 12 noon, uh, both a Fusion Boys Pool Party at one location and a Fusion Girls Pool Party at another location. Please see Brother and Sister Collins for information about what to bring. They'll be providing popsicles and pizza it looks like I can't get back far enough to read it and uh, and so so to get with them about the additional things that you will need to bring for that amen uh, I think it was sister Zaff that made the banana nut bread did you that stuff is amazing it is horrible on a diet and but it is really good and uh, there's, there's some stuff left over in, from Sunday in the coffee shop. So if you get a chance and, and you want to ruin your diet, step, step in there. And uh, you want to stay up late, get yourself a DW and, uh, or some other drink that we got. And uh, DW stands for Dent Walker. And it is a amazing shaken espresso, chocolate shaken espresso. And uh, it'll bless your soul. You might, you might be dancing like Dent Walker by the time you get it done. And so, uh, amen. But the big, big announcement is for this upcoming uh, fourth Sunday, the 4th of July celebration. And we will be having an 11 a.m. service only. We are needing some people that can help us out immediately after service by helping set up some tables in the fellowship hall. And Brother Seaton will be overseeing that. And if you can uh, go in there afterwards just provide a little bit of muscle and, and work, setting up the rest of our tables with some chairs. That would be greatly appreciated. We'll be playing baseball or softball and volleyball, so if you're interested in doing that, make sure you bring your gloves, your bats, and, and your balls on Sunday. And then make sure you wear your TAC t-shirt. Amen. And uh, so wear that and support that. And your team color, your bandana. Make sure you support your team. Hopefully we'll have a couple events. It'll be a uh, team against team. We got washers, uh, beanbag toss, all kinds of great things, water slides for the kids. Please dress appropriate for that. Do not wear bathing suit material and stuff like that. Just throw them in a, you know, typical Pentecostal garb when it comes down to water slides and stuff like that. We'll just have a good time. It may be raining. It may not. We live in Southeast Texas. They could say 75% chance of rain and we'll have blue skies. They could say 25% chance of rain. And it'd be pouring cats and dogs, so we don't know. And so just come prepared to have a good time. Because it might be raining. I, I remember one of my first, I, was, I think it was a, an event we had here my first year. I got ready to walk out the door, and it started pouring rain. I was like, oh, no. So I went back, and I changed. And I got over to the church, and it stopped. And I looked outside, I'm like, what in the world is going on? And then by the time the event started, it was pouring rain again. You know, it was like blue skies, cloudy skies. So we just never know what it's going to be. So come prepared for everything. I want to encourage you. Come at a little bit early for church and set up your canopies, your uh, chairs and lawn chairs out there around the baseball field. Uh, there is going to be an ice cream uh, booth that will be here. And it will, they'll be selling for dessert ice cream scoops for a, a dollar. And, and it's going to be some good stuff wonderful thing about that is for every dollar you spend, somebody in our community is going to go ahead and match that dollar with another dollar, and so uh, make sure you bring a few dollars with you to buy some ice cream, or bring five dollars or twenty dollars, whatever it might be, because whatever you spend on ice cream, it'll be matched to go towards our building program, amen, and so uh, if anybody can help out with the food afterwards, see, please see Sister Tiffany Appel and Brother Appel will be doing barbecuing. They'll be in charge of all that. So if you want to help out with that, the church is providing hamburgers, hot dogs, drinks, chips. If you want 
about something else in addition to that. I want to encourage you. It's picnic style. Just bring it on out. We'll have a great time in our Sunday morning service. I am expecting God to do great things on Sunday at 11 o'clock. Amen. I am expecting lives to be changed, people to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Maybe even somebody baptized in Jesus' name. But if we come with the expectation, amen, then God always shows up, amen, and meets our level of expectation. So I'm looking forward to that, and I want to encourage you, please make sure you hold this weekend up in prayer. Why don't we stand together right now as we get ready to take our Tuesday evening tithe and offering and worship the Lord in our giving. God, we love you. Thank you for your faithfulness, your goodness to us. ask you right now, Lord, bless the gift and the giver. Lord, bless us as we worship you in our giving. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you as you worship me.
Come on, there's no one like him. There's none like him. He alone is worthy of all glory and honor. Hallelujah, hallelujah. That's it. Clap your hands. Lift up the name above every other name. Hallelujah, Jesus, we thank you. Glory, hallelujah, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Woo. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, <laughs> there is no one like our God. There is no one. <laughs> There is no one. No, hey, 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 hey. Reign is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Jesus, you're worthy. You're worthy, you're worthy. Hallelujah, there is no one like you. None that can compare. Amen, amen. Amen, amen. What a great God. Turn to your neighbor and say, I think you're pretty great. But nowhere near my God. Open your Bibles with me, if you would. Matthew chapter 22. Mr. Hagen. I don't know how I hit 33. Last two weeks, two, three weeks ago, I had her looking for Matthew 33 and 36. And she looked and looked and looked. She even Googled it, I think. There's no Matthew 33. It was 22 and 36. And uh, Jesus said, they asked him, What's, Master, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. As thyself. And before you're seated, turn to your neighbor. Say, do you love God? Do you love me? And then one last question before you're seated. Will you be here Thursday night for all church prayer at 7 p.m.? If they said yes, they may be seated. The rest of you have to stand the whole time. No, you're not seated. Several Tuesdays ago when I tormented Sister Haygood with Matthew 33, I started a series on purpose. What is our purpose? Answering the question within the context of I am the church and you are the church. What is our purpose? And we'll be answering the question, what is our purpose individually? What is our purpose? Or what is the purpose of the church? And what is purpose in the first place? I'll be discussing in this series various aspects of purpose that apply directly to each of us and also as it applies to us as the body of Christ and then dive later on into the individual purpose towards the end of the study because I think everybody has a question burning in them. What's, what's my purpose? What am I here for? What does God want to do with me, through me? And, and we all, even though we, we generally can narrow it down that, that we are here to love God and love our neighbor, it, but within the context of that, well, what's my ministry? What's my calling? What's my purpose in life to that greater, deeper level? And so, as the scripture we opened with lets us know our first pur purpose is to love God. With all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our mind. And the second one, pretty closely connected 
to the first one. Our purpose is to love our neighbor. To love our neighbor. And we must have an unconditional love for one another. I thank God that love is not blind. God's love is not blind. Human love is blind. Nor is God's love dumb. It's intelligent. It, it operates off of spiritual wisdom. But as 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and 8 lets us know that God's love is patient, it is kind, Charity, and I, that's reading the King James Version. I got a different version. I'm sorry. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. Anybody here ever easily angered? <laughs> Thank you, Brother Riley, for being just so right up front and honest. He's like right here. <laughs> not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. Always hopes. Always perseveres. Verse 8, love never fails. That's God's love. That's, that's God's love. And as a member of the body of Christ, everything I say and do is based on this biblical foundation of love. And being a part of the body of Christ is, is not about privileges. It's not about perks. It's not about seniority or rights. It's about loving. It's about loving. It's interesting when we think about love. Those what, I, I see some grandparents that just become absolute fools when grandkids show up. They lose their ever-living minds and, and do things and say things that no normal adult individual would do or say. To their kids, they were tight and chintzy. To their grandkids, they're like giving them 20s and 100s. And the kids are like, what, what happened? Did senility set in or something? You know, what, what's going on? It seems like the more seniority we get, the more we love. The more we're willing to give. The more we're willing to try to do something to have an impact. And so it's about loving and serving. It's about belonging to something bigger and greater than I could ever be by myself. It's about being where God has placed us. He's placed us here in this body for a purpose because there are people here that God wants me to serve and there are people here that will serve me and be a blessing into my life and, and will speak words of encouragement and challenge to each and every one of us in this place. So we all have a purpose in the body of Christ. And so Last session, it was about loving, loving one another. This is going to be about unity. At a meeting of the American Psychological Association, a man by the name of Jack Lipton, who was a psychologist at Union College, presented some pretty interesting findings, and he did years of research on symphony orchestras and wanted to find out what made them click so well and gel so well together. He come to find out that Amongst the orchestra people, the percussionists were viewed as insensitive, unintelligent, and hard of hearing, yet they were fun to be around. Nothing personal, Quentin. You were the drummer tonight. I mean, it's just all percussionists. The, the symphony orchestra had a, a view of string players as arrogant and stuffy and unathletic. The orchestra members almost overwhelmingly chose the word loud as the primary adjective to describe the, ba the bass, bass, brass players, brass players, not bass pro players, <laughs> brass players. The woodwind players seemed to be held in the highest esteem. They were described as quiet, meticulous, and a bit egotistical. 
And, and with the, such a wide divergence of personalities and preconceived ideas about one another, how does this group of people come together to make such wonderful music? And the answer is simple. That regardless of how those musicians viewed each other, they subordinated their feelings and their biases to the leadership of the conductor. They submitted to his direction. And they used their gifts and their talents under his guidance to together play beautiful music. And such is the body of Christ. Differences? Absolutely. Preconceived ideas? Oh, yes, without a doubt. But when we submit who we are, to the master conductor, to the master conductor, and obey him, we can make wonderful music in the spirit together as we work together with our different voices and different talents that we bring together to make this thing called the church uh, be something absolutely beautiful and amazing. Unity. Being a valuable member of the body of Christ means that I will, con I will be a conduit of unity for others. I'm going to help other people connect. John 13, 35, 34 and 35. Jesus had just finished washing his disciples' feet and has given us in the final instructions to them before they leave the upper room and depart for the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must, not should, not may, not are encouraged to, but you must love one another. Because why? Because verse 35 says, by this will everyone know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The world will know that we are true followers of Jesus Christ by our love one for another. Not by the sticker that you have on the back window of your car. Not by the TAC t-shirt that you wear. Not even by the fact that you may look or dress Pentecostal or whatever it is on the outside. But they'll see when they see love in action, they'll know, oh, they're a follower of Christ. See, love means to love in a social and moral sense, to welcome, to entertain, to be fond of, to love dearly, to be willing to protect. To be divided is sinful. In fact, even Jesus prays that we should be one in John 17, 22. Unity is necessary. Unity is commanded by Jesus Christ. But unity is not without its requirements. That there is a chorus of religious voices that have been speaking up probably the last four or five years. That they are saying we need to join together in a worldwide unity. And, and what they're saying is that Christians of all doctrinal shades and beliefs must come together as one visible organization. Regardless of theological differences, they're saying that we should unite. And they use John 17, 22, where the Lord's Jesus prayed that they may be one, even as we are one, as a scripture to attempt to promote this worldwide unity. But listen to me this evening. Such teaching is absolutely false teaching. It's reckless teaching and it's dangerous teaching because truth alone must be the thing that determines our alignment. Truth comes before unity and unity without Truth is spiritually dangerous. In fact, when we dive into this scripture of the Lord's Prayer in John 17, we got to go beyond just that little verse there at verse 22 and jump back and get the whole context of what Jesus is saying. So let's jump back in our Bibles to verse 14, where Jesus says, I have given them thy word, and the world hateth them because they are not of the world, even as I am not. Of the world but I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil they are not of the world even as I am not of the world 
Verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Leave that scripture there if you would, Brother Hughes. Sanctify. That word in the Greek means to separate them from profane things and dedicate them to God. We're pulling something out of the common, the ordinary things that would defile and sinful, and we're setting them apart. And not just setting them apart, but then dedicating them to the service of God. Is what the word sanctify means. It means to make holy, to purify, to consecrate. Sanctify them through. That word through is a very powerful word. It, it is a preposition denoting a fixed position. Implying there's only one way for them to be sanctified. It's fixed. And, and, and this, this fixing, it's in a particular place or time or state. And there's only one way that instrumentally it can be sanctified. And that is through truth. There's no other way. See, there's a separating process that goes on through when people come out of the darkness into his marvelous light. There's a sanctifying process. It's not through man's philosophies. It's not through cunning words of humanistic presentation. It's not through feel-good sermons and dimly lit auditoriums and grace, 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 grace. But it's through the truth of God's word. Only through the truth of God's word. So you and I were separated from darkness through the light of the word of God. We were separated from sin through the blood. And we were separated through carnal living by obedience to the word of God. And we were set free from the common to be connected to holy things through truth. Truth alone. Jump back a little bit further to Jesus' words in John 8 and 31. Then Jesus said to the Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed. Knowing his word is not enough to make you one of his disciples. He says you got to continue in my word. It's got to be an ongoing daily aspect of, of what you do. You can't pick it up one day and put it down the next. I'm going to submit to you on Sundays and Tuesdays because i got to go to church and i I got to perform and i got to uh, usher or greet or be up on a platform or whatever I do. But when we submit to that word and we walk in that word, amen, what we do is we continue in his word. And if, that's a horrible word, because it lets us know that some of us are not going to continue in that word. We get another word that comes into our head that we'd rather do, and it's usually our word. We get another way that comes before our, our, our will, and it's usually my way. And when we start following my way and my word, we're no longer walking in his word. But if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. See, we've got to be in His Word. We've got to be in it, and it's got to be in us. It's got to become a part of us. Jumping back to John 17, verse 18 says, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Leave that verse there. 18. That word, as. It, it, it's, it's, it's got a pretty significant meaning. It means in the exact same way. The same way that he came into the world, so I've sent them into the world. I, I'm sorry to, for those of you that think Jesus came to just kiss babies, hold hands, and sing kumbaya. That's not what he came for. Jesus did not come to pacify people who held religious rituals above God's word. He didn't come to validate religious lies or political propaganda. He came with truth. He came with power and he came with authority. And he unified people to truth 
and he also repulsed and repelled those who refused to acknowledge the truth. That they flee from him. Matthew 10, 34 says this, Think not that I've come to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace, but I came with a sword. I came to bring a sword. And even so have I sent them. He didn't change the mission. He didn't change his plan. The method and the message doesn't change when the baton was transferred from him to us. Truth is still required before unity can ever take place. Verse 19, and for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified through the truth again. Neither pray I for these alone, but for all them which shall believe on me through their word. You see, it's only once we get through the filter of truth, it's only after we get through the sanctification process of going through truth, that we get to the unification process in verse 21, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Only those who are sanctified through truth can be one in Christ. Only those in alignment with God's truth can be one in Christ. And only those who follow God's Law and God's word and God's way unite. And to teach anything else is to betray this precious gospel. Friend, a unity that is built on anything other than the truth of the word of God has the shifting sands of humanism, secularism, and the spirit of this world. And anything built on that foundation, the word of God lets us know it's not going to stand. It's not going to stand. Amen. May, may I stop for a second and just lay something out there? Amen. Don't expect me to go hold hands with compromise for the sake of unity. Don't expect the apostolic church to go shaking hands and, and singing kumbaya with anybody else that's not in truth. Amen. Don't expect us. Uh, amen. I would rather be divided by truth than united by error. Amen. I'll say that again. I'd rather be divided by truth than united in an error. We will not be harsh. We will not be critical or rude because that's not the foundation of this church. This man doesn't have a rude bone in his body. Me and Brother Honeycutt, we were kind of complaining about our wives this morning to one another. I know that shocks Sister Honeycutt. <laughs> and, and we were just kind of joking around, you know, and, and, and goofing off. And, and, and he, he's sitting over there just so nice and kind. I said, we're just sitting over here complaining about our wives. And he goes, well, I'll have none to do with that. Because <laughs> in his book, these are precious women. So we will not be rude, critical, or harsh, but don't think for a moment that us not being that way is a sign of weakness. You hear me? Because we don't put other people down, because we don't preach about what other people should be doing or what they're not doing, don't take that as a sign of weakness. Amen, because that is not weakness at all. Amen. Don't mistake silence for agreement because we will unite on the foundation of truth and nothing else. We will unite with those that are in truth and sanctified through truth and nothing else. And unity is vital to the health of the local church. It is absolutely vital. So vital that every single person here, you and I included, must contribute to the unity of the church. But it has to have a foundation of truth. It's got to have a foundation of truth. As a church member, you have the responsibility to be a source of unity. 
You are never to be a divisive force. You are to love your fellow church members unconditionally. And well, that may not mean that you agree with everyone all the time. It does mean that you're willing to sacrifice your preferences to keep unity in the church. That's a hard pill for some people to swallow. Things change. People love their opinions. <laughs> they really do. People love their opinions. And I'm one of those people, you know, I, I, I tell people frequently, one of my ex-district presbyters wrote a book called People Are Pitiful. And we're all people. We're all people. And, and unity means that I'm willing to put my preferences my opinion aside for the sake of unity as long as it's not compromising on truth hear me if it's just my opinion well i don't like those ugly flowers and i love the flowers too so what about it? i'm just i'm just using that as an example i don't like those ugly flowers have you seen those new ugly flowers they got in the church? My Lord, who did that? How much money did they spend on that? Oh, you're not going to say anything? What do you think about them? Until they go to somebody else. And they go to somebody else. Until they find someone who has the same opinion. And they start sharing their opinion. You know, and, 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 and so they, they, it's a preference issue. Really, like I preached about on, on Sunday morning, get over yourself. You didn't have to do it. Thank God somebody did. We sacrifice our own preferences. It's funny, brother. Brother Dews has a, a car broken down in the, in the parking lot. It's been there for what? Three weeks now? My Lord. Brother, Brother Roundtree, can you help us out? No. <laughs> Here's the thing. It's parked in the best spot in the parking lot. It's got shade all day long. You know how many people have asked me about moving that car? Because it's in the best parking spot in the church parking lot. I'm like, I don't know whose car that is, you know, and I know Tina Cooper had problems with her car like a week ago, and so I thought it was her car for a while, I'm like, well, it's not hers, you know, and then, so I went and started investigating, and it looked like some homeless dude lived in it, you know, and then I realized it was Tyron. <laughs> but the thing that gets us upset is so petty for so many. And, and, and hear me, I'm not, I'm not mad at you because I get upset over petty stuff too. You can ask our secretary. <laughs> I mean, I'm just acknowledging our humanity. We all have this tendency to get upset over my petty preference when it really is not a big deal. Where if we were more concerned about loving our neighbor as ourselves. That second greatest commandment, then we'd be thinking more about unity. How can I build somebody up? What did I see when I walked into the church that I appreciated, that I liked? What, what during the worship service could I take away that was good and uplifting and encouraging and challenging? D Brother Daniel Paul did a great job opening service. He did a great job opening service. He came walking back. I'm like, good job, man. That was good. Find something that somebody did that was uplifting. If it was the sound, the multimedia, find something. But don't find something negative. That doesn't unify. Negativity repels and pushes people away from us. That does not create a spirit of unity. 
Colossians 3, 10 through 15 says, put on your new nature. Leave the old you in the prayer room. Leave the opinionated, preference-driven me and you in the prayer room and put on the, your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like your old self. You when you're doing good. We when we're doing good is still pretty bad. Become like him. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. It doesn't matter if you're parked in the shade or parked in the sun. <laughs> circumcised or uncircumcised. Barbaric. See, husbands, your wife thinks you're barbaric. It's okay. Uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters. And he lives in all of us. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourself with, this is a great concept right here. Jesus did not dress you to come to church tonight. Y'all dressed yourself, hopefully. Even I picked this out myself. But I read someone's mind right there. They said, yeah, but you've worn out like 50 times this year already. We clothe ourselves. We put our own socks on. We put our own clothes on, our shirt, or whatever it is that you do. Clothe yourself, meaning you've got to do this. I've got to do this. Tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. The Holy Ghost doesn't shake us and go, stop being a rude idiot. Be kind to them. Be nice to them. It, it doesn't stop us in the midst of our tirades and, and over preference and say, stop doing that. You've got to do this. <clears throat> we have to do this. We have to do this. Tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Brother Tyron, all those people that called me, forgive you. <laughs> Anybody can fix a transmission, let Brother Tyron know. Did you already sell it? I know you got a new car, but we need to get your old car out of the church parking lot. <laughs> Start, char start charging you rent. <laughs> Remember, <laughs> the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourself with love, which does what? Remember that song? Bind us together. Lord, bind us together. Why are you laughing at my singing? <laughs> Would you whip her when you get home? <laughs> With cords that cannot be broken. What is it that binds us? His love. His love binds us together. I won't sing again. Verse 15, and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. What a challenge. What a challenge, Brother Jordan. From the strongest of us to the weakest of us. Hear me, we have a responsibility. You have a responsibility. Her, her connection in the church. And you for hers, and you for her, and you for her. 
and you for his. We have the responsibility to love them and connect with them. To make sure we don't see somebody walking out distraught and upset and crying. We have a responsibility to reach out to them, to, to pray for someone that raises their hand when they say they need prayer. It, it's not necessarily the minister's job to make their way back to that person and pray for them. The same Holy Ghost in the ministry is the same Holy Ghost in you. And if you saw them, maybe God is using you to pray for them and put a hand on their shoulder and be a source of connection. And that's a challenge for each and every one of us. You see, snowflakes are one of nature's most fragile things. But look what happens when they stick together. Look what happens when they stick together, and such is the church. Individually, we may not be much, but when we stick together, we're a force to be reckoned with. There was a Peanuts cartoon. Lucy walks into the living room. And Linus is sitting there, and he's all kicked back in his recliner chair. She says, get out of the chair. He sits up, he's scared, and he closes it, and he gets up, and, and, and he moves, and she sits down. And he goes, what makes you think you can just walk in here and make demands like that, that I get up and get out of the chair so you can sit down? She goes, you see these five fingers? Individually, they may not be much, but when I curl them together... They are a force to be reckoned with. The next sign is, is, is Linus walking out and he's standing in the kitchen. He's going, how come you guys can't get together like that? <laughs> and my question to the apostolic church on a Tuesday night, what would happen in the spirit world in southeast Texas? If we quit being, what can I do, and 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 what can I do, what's my ministry, what's my purpose, what's my job, what about me, what about my seat, what about where I park, who's going to talk to me, who's going to greet, what if it stopped being that? And all of a sudden, this love and this unity got a hold of us. Uh, and we realized that greater is he that is in us uh, than he uh, that is in the world. And I'm here to tell you this morning, you talk about turning uh, our world upside down. What would happen if we united together in prayer, amen, for a Sunday morning service on the 4th of July and said, God, you're going to show up and do something great. Someone's going to be healed. Someone's going to be delivered. Someone's going to be set free. I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. Amen. And I want you to believe it with me. And I want you to join together with me in prayer and believe that God's going to do something great. Amen. Why don't we do that right now? Why don't you stand to your feet and join with somebody next to you? Amen. And let's join together in love and unity. Amen. Believing that God. Oh, God. My Lord, in your name, unite us. Unite us through truth, uh, first and foremost, O oh God. Unite us, O oh God, through the sanctification of truth, O oh God, but through your spirit right now. In the name of Jesus, uh, we pray. Oh, God, for a great and mighty outpouring. Lord, for a multitude of lost souls that will find their way through an apostolic door on Sunday morning. Oh, God, they may be coming for a barbecue, but I'm